Let's pray. Lord God, the story of Jesus' crucifixion and death stands on its own. No words that I can say can add to its power and its might. But may our faith be strengthened by this time we spend together, by this music, these prayers. And if it is your will, by the words that are spoken here, may they be your words, that faith may grow on this very important day, this day, Good Friday. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm not sure how to proceed with the thoughts of the sermon because I'm hesitant to measure the impact and the appropriate nature of humor on Good Friday. It's a, it's a solemn night. It's a somber tone. All of the worship is meant for that. And, it, and for good reason, right? Because Jesus died. He died because we are sinners. He died for all of us. And so everything that we have in this worship service is direct and serious. We recognize in this worship service, maybe more than in any other throughout the year, our need for a Savior who can defeat the things that we cannot defeat, sin, death, and the devil. On the other hand, I remind you that Jesus by his death has set you free. He has set you free from those powers that we name tonight. And it may be important from time to time in that freedom to laugh in the face of those powers because Jesus is on the cross uh, crucified. He has defeated those powers and set them aside and put them in their place for your freedom. And so I offer you this little story. There is a great episode of Seinfeld in which, in which George Costanza is bemoaning the direction of his life. And they're sitting together in the, in the restaurant where they always sit, and he says, how did it turn out like this for me? I had such promise. And then he goes on and he says, every decision I have ever made in my entire life has been wrong. My life has turned out to be the complete opposite of everything I wanted it to be. And so George decides then and there to do everything different. He orders a different lunch. He says, nothing has ever worked out for me with tuna on toast. It's the lunch he always eats. And then he notices a, a young lady in the cafe who is looking over at him. And he's hesitant to walk over and to, and to talk to her. And Jerry says, well, if everything that you've ever done in your life has been wrong, then the opposite must be right. And so he goes over to the young lady, and instead of using some sappy come online, he says, my name is George. I'm unemployed, and I live with my parents. <laughs> he does the opposite. You know, just before worship, a grandmother and her grandchild came in and said, would it be okay for us to ask you, why is this called Good Friday? And I said, well, you know what? That's what our sermon is about. Good Friday is opposite day. It's opposite day. When I was younger, I used to ask the same question. What on earth could possibly be good about this day? Why even call it that? And I'll tell you why we call it that. Because we are people who believe in the opposite. Our God is constantly destroying human conventional wisdom and doing what is considered foolish. Everything that we do embraces this. We believe that death needs, leads to new life. We believe in the opposite. So Jesus, for Jesus, that portal through which he passes to defeat the powers of, of sin and death on our behalf are not the end of the story. All of our theology embraces the opposite. And our everyday life embraces the opposite. Martin Luther taught that the life of the Christian is a life of repentance, through which we will remember our baptism every day and the old sinner will be washed away and a new person will be raised up every day. We are people of the opposite. You know, sometimes we scratch our heads and we think, why don't more people want to come to church? You know, about 12% of Americans worship on a given weekend. Why don't more people, why don't more people come? Why doesn't the church grow faster than it does? But should we really wonder? Wonder? when everything that we say to the world is so counter 
to conventional wisdom and contemporary thought. Jesus dies, and he calls all of you to die as well. That's not the greatest marketing slogan, folks. That's not the greatest slogan to take to the world. But that's who we are, and that's our message. We do the opposite. You know why? Because our God is a God of the opposite. When we work hard and we earn money, we do the opposite. We don't hoard it. We don't stash it all away. We give away money. Why do we do that? Christians, to honor God and thank God, oh yeah, to serve our neighbor, certainly, to discipline ourselves in a life of faith, yes, but also because our giving reflects the God who is a God of the opposite. God doesn't withhold. God gives and blesses over and over again in our lives and catches us up in the work of God's kingdom. A lot of people sleep in on Sunday morning. You know what we do? We do the opposite. We take that one short hour uh, of a weekend, a Saturday night or a Sunday morning, to go and orient our life back toward God, the love of God, and the love of neighbor. And I'm not saying it makes sense. Really, I'm not. As a matter of fact, I'm saying the opposite. There's that word again. And you know what? In 1 Corinthians, that's what Paul says about crucifixion. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. God was pleased through the foolishness of our preaching to save those who believe. Jews demand signs, Greek demand, Greeks demand wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. Good Friday is opposite day. And we are opposite people because we have an opposite God. And so we're called not to... Not to focus solely on ourselves, but to serve others with the heart of Christ who washed feet, who healed the sick, who welcomed sinners. Uh, Jesus' whole life was a walking, talking parable of the opposite mindset of God. Blessed are the poor. Blessed are the meek. It's everywhere in the Bible. It's the whole story. Until finally, on Good Friday, Jesus enacts the ultimate of opposites, the one that none of us can truly, fully fathom when he goes up against what the early church called our final enemy, the last enemy, death itself. No one expected the Messiah to come and bear a cross. That's not what a great, powerful, glorious God does. And Peter says, perish the thought. How dare you even think of, of taking up a cross? So if you're here to worship on Good Friday, then I want to know, what does it feel like to be a part of a community that is so 180 degrees from the rest of the world? Because we are opposite people. Worshiping a man who died on a cross will never be conventional no matter how much we try to make it so. It won't be. Our lives will never fit the mold. This is the day when all of the opposites collide and we can only sit back and cry at the depth of our sin or laugh at the absurdity of our message. God does the opposite and we follow suit. In my neighborhood... Something happens every spring that I have yet to fully understand or embrace. We spend all winter snow blowing our driveways. And we blow all of the snow off of the driveway onto the grass so that we can get in and out of our homes. And then in March and April, these hilarious, wonderful retired guys in my cul-de-sac, they do the opposite. They, blow dry, they, they snow blow their yards and put the snow back on their driveways. So that, have you seen this in Sarto? So maybe it's just our neighborhood sky. So that the snow can melt faster on the pavement of the driveway or, or, or of the road. Nowhere else have I ever seen this, this silliness anywhere that I have ever lived or witnessed it anywhere. We must in Sarto live in the land of the opposite, at least my neighborhood where no conventional thinking takes root. But wh whatever that may be, I love my neighbors, I appreciate them, they're so wonderful, but still we ask, why is the world the way it is? Why is there such brokenness? Why is, is there such 
selfishness and sin everywhere. Can Good Friday really be good after all? So we come to a service like that with all of those questions, and Jesus doesn't answer those questions by giving us a treatise or a great uh, wisdom. He doesn't give us this new philosophy. He doesn't point us to devotionals or best-selling self-help books. He doesn't hold our sins over our head and, and threaten us with hellfire. Instead, he does the opposite. He dies. And then he bids us to do the opposite as well with unique measures for what it means to be successful in life, with new eyes for seeing God at work, and new freedom, yes, freedom, to even laugh in the face of our last enemy, death. All of this from an opposite God and an opposite Messiah who creates an opposite people. Amen.